Good morning, and thank you for joining us for this briefing, and thank you to Margie Prop for being here to provide translation services. Uh, we're here today to talk about our draft climate action plan. The coronavirus pandemic has shown us what it is like to face a global threat together. Times have been tough as we've dealt with one unprecedented situation after another, yet amidst the disruption and uncertainty, we have found deep wells of resilience as a community. We have designed solutions to new problems. We have developed new ways to help one another. And we've discovered new ways to strengthen our community. And while it hasn't arrived as a distinct event like the pandemic, our planet's accelerated rate of climate change also poses a global threat and one of the greatest challenges humanity has ever faced. We know now that flooding, drought, Extreme heat and related health problems are some of the most important climate risks we will face in Lincoln in coming decades. These climate impacts affect all of us, everyone who calls Lincoln home. One of my top priorities after taking office last year was to commission a climate action plan so that here in Lincoln, we would be well informed about the, about the challenges we face and be prepared to mitigate them and adapt. Today, I am pleased to announce the release of the draft climate action plan and to outline, ne outline next steps for review and feedback from the community. I invite all our residents to review the draft plan at lincoln.ne.gov keyword resilience and to participate in the upcoming public engagement process that will finalize the plan. The draft plan illuminates how we can grow our community's resilience, defined as our ability to recover from shocks and our capacity to thrive in the midst of a continually changing environment. And while the plan addresses issues and impacts brought on by a rapidly changing environment, the thrust of this effort is actually about protecting our people and ensuring our good quality of life for the future. It's also about steering innovation and encouraging local solutions. In this sense, the draft plan continues the visionary efforts to ensure a strong and resilient future made by Lincolnites who came before us. The late Roger Larson, with whom I had the privilege of serving on planning commission, was fond of reminding us that we all drink from wells we did not dig. He's right, and in the case of Lincoln residents from the 1930s, that's literally true. That's when our community began constructing well fields near the Platte River and pipelines to bring that water to a city whose growth depended upon it. Later in the 1960s, the people of Lincoln ensured that Holmes Lake Dam was created to prevent flooding throughout central Lincoln and provide park and recreational amenities. And in the 1990s, our community began the Antelope Valley improvements that helped protect a flourishing downtown. These are just a few of the examples of how community members in the distant and recent past have made smart, long-term choices and changes to make Lincoln a strong and thriving place to call home. Now, it's our turn to do the smart planning and make the good choices that will ensure our community continues to thrive for the next 100 years. Though, unlike our predecessors, we undertake this effort in the face of an accelerated rate of climate change that poses urgent and unprecedented threats to the quality of life that generations of Lincolnites have worked so hard to create. The achievement of a great undertaking like this begins with a vision. I announced earlier this uh, month at the State of the City Address that our plan contains an ambitious goal. In collaboration with our publicly owned Lincoln Electric System, we have committed to a goal of an 80% net reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions here in Lincoln by the year 2050. This goal, often referred to as 80 by 50, is also being set by other communities across the country and around the world that seek to transition to a low carbon future. This is an all-encompassing visionary goal that invites everyone in Lincoln to play a part in preventing climate hazards and protecting our quality of life. In fact, broad community involvement will be the key to our success, and that's why we convened and sought input from the Climate Resiliency Task Force, the City's Sustainability Working Group, my Environmental Task Force, and a number of other community businesses and organizations to create the draft plan. We likewise sought information from a diverse cross-section of residents to inform the development of a menu of recommended strategies to increase our community's resilience. That work was led by Kim Morrow 
of Verdes Group. And I'm deeply grateful to Kim and to Verdes Group for their expertise and leadership in the creation of the draft plan. At this point, I invite Kim to share more about that process and the plan. Thank you, Mayor. And thanks to so many across our community who contributed their feedback and expertise to this draft climate action plan. The process to create a draft plan began over a year ago and involved many steps. First, every good plan begins with research. As the mayor mentioned, Lincoln is fortunate to have a solid background of past and current work related to sustainability and resilience. We drew from this work, including reviewing the Solid Waste Plan, the Comprehensive Plan, the Lincoln Environmental Action Plan, the Water Management Plan, and the Local Emergency Operations Plan. We also consulted with local and regional climatologists. We gathered past and projected climate data for Lincoln. We determined projected water demand based on climate and population growth projections. And we accessed data about our community from the Lincoln Vital Signs Project and other sources. We reviewed transportation data, floodplain maps, and other hazard maps to establish scientific baselines and understand possible climate risks to our community. We then facilitated multiple workshops, full group meetings, and one-on-one -on -one meetings with the Climate Resilience Task Force, the Sustainability Working Group, the Mayor's Environmental Task Force, and other stakeholders and groups. Some of the communities represented included business, government, nonprofit, faith, education, public health, emergency management, immigrant and refugee populations, those with disabilities, and low-income residents. The task here was to identify climate risks for Lincoln and to provide solutions that would keep Lincoln's businesses, neighborhoods, schools, parks, and other institutions and amenities strong and resilient in the face of those challenges. During this work, Veritas Group analyzed data and continued to confer with subject matter experts. Finally, we took all of the ideas that had been generated and organized them into eight main action areas of climate solutions. Energy, transportation, economy, health and safety, food, green space, waste, and community engagement. The focus on greenhouse gas and carbon reduction invites innovation and solutions across the widest range of stakeholders. It's important to note that not all strategies can be implemented at once. Instead, the draft climate action plan lays out the challenges before us and the menu of strategies for the short term, medium term, and long term that can address them. This draft plan is being released to the public for additional feedback and suggestions in order to make it a more refined plan for Lincoln. The next steps are to engage in a process across the community to help define what strategies Lincoln wants to use to chart its path to our 80 by 50 goal of a strong, thriving, and resilient future. I'd like to thank the mayor and all of the community for their help in shaping this draft climate action plan. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you to you and Veritas Group uh, and your team for incorporating the community input we've received to date and translating that into a broad menu of strategies and opportunities for local action. Now, with the release of the draft climate action plan, we begin the next phase of public engagement. We want to connect across all sectors of our community and discuss which of the many strategies contained in the plan will help create Lincoln's best path to the future. To lead that work, I am very pleased to introduce Mickey Esposito as the new Senior Policy Advisor to the Mayor and Head of the Resilient Lincoln Initiative. She will lead the next phase of community engagement, review, and feedback of the draft plan. Mickey is well known and respected across our community from her roles within state and city government as well as in the private sector. Her experience and expertise align perfectly with the job ahead. Mickey has a bachelor's degree in biology and a law degree with an emphasis in natural resources and environmental law. She began her career as an attorney for the Nebraska Department of Environmental Quality. In 2009, she led the environmental cleanup of the West Haymarket Redevelopment and Arena site 
transforming a 100-year-old rail yard and brownfield site into what is now today a retail office, residential, and entertainment district in Lincoln. As Director of Lincoln Transportation and Utilities from 2011 to 2019, Mickey led a number of environmental and resiliency initiatives for the city, including the development of a comprehensive water management plan, the Antelope Valley Flood Control and Community Revitalization Project, the 2040 Solid Waste Plan, and conversion of the Star Tri Tran Fleet to alter alternative fuels, the Lincoln Wastewater System Biogas to Fuel Project, and many more. Mickey's background and passion for improving life in Lincoln make her a great choice as the head of Resilient Lincoln and for engaging our community with the plan. Mickey, welcome, and thank you for bringing your leadership and expertise to this effort. Please come up and say a few words. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Kim, for this incredible work product that you've put out, you and Veritas. I want to also thank the Climate Resilience Task Force, the Sustainability Working Group, the Mayor's Environmental Task Force, Lincoln Electric System, and the many others who contributed to this draft plan. I am so looking forward to working with you. Uh, we are certainly experiencing a challenging time, but as I've heard Mayor say so many times, Challenge creates opportunity, and I am so excited about this opportunity for our community. I am ready to embrace the community and work together to help shape Lincoln's Climate Action Plan. I want our citizens to know that I am eager to engage with you and listen to your ideas and feedback. My priority is to cultivate a meaningful engagement process that will lead us toward the goal of 80 by 50 and the strong and thriving future it will support. It is my privilege to be here, uh, to be a part of this team, and to work with our community to build a stronger, more resilient future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mickey. I look forward to working with you and engaging the community in these efforts. Um, I'm also excited about this work because it's clear that Lincoln has leaders across many sectors who already embrace the wisdom and practicality of planning for a strong and resilient future. We're joined this morning by one of those leaders, Council Member Jane Rebold. We all know her as one of the seven hardworking members of our Lincoln City Council, but she's here today to talk about her work in the private sector and about how the company she helps lead, BNR Stores, already uses sustainability and resiliency within their successful business operations. Welcome, Jane. Thanks, Mayor, and thanks so much for your leadership on this very important task force and the work. You know, like many other businesses across Lincoln, we know that sustainability and resiliency makes good business sense and also improves our bottom line. At Super Saver and Russ's, we continuously research ways to be better stewards of our environment by reducing landfill waste and energy consumption. Here are just a few examples of this throughout our, all of our operations. We have been recycling cardboard for over 40 years. Our company alone recycles 175 tons of cardboard each month, providing a positive income stream for the most part, and more importantly, diverting this commodity from our landfills. For more than 20 years, used cooking oil from the bakery and deli has been recycled and then reconstituted into biodiesel fuel. When we design new stores and remodel existing ones, we look for energy efficiencies in every opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint. We use better insulation, we use distributed load systems that I love talking about for cooling cases, instead of those long runs of copper piping for coolant that take you all the way back to a rack room. LED lighting is everywhere now and used for both the interior and exterior lighting to conserve energy. Customers continue to see more LED lights on refrigerated door cases and honestly in all refrigerated cases. LED lights 
and doors reduce electrical usage by 70 percent, 70 percent, and they have a return on an investment in around 18 months. Best of all, LEDs do not emit heat, which means they don't waste additional energy to offset the lighting heat in refrigerated cases to keep the cases cool. At some, to at some stores, we actually redirect the heat using heat reclaim from compressors that operate the refrigerated cases. Now, heat reclaim has been going on for many, many years. That recirculated heat goes to the water heaters and to heat the store in the winter. We also strive to reduce and conserve the amount of supplies and packaging used to help reduce what our customers ultimately dispose of and ends up in the landfill. All of our stores collect those plastic shopping bags for recycling. The pa plastic bags are then sent to a manufacturer that repurposes those bags and mixes sawdust to create that faux wood planks used in most decks nowadays and outdoor structures. In addition, we still host recycling centers at some of our locations. Lastly, we are so very proud to have been selected by the Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy for a grant that allows us to install six electric vehicle charging stations at six of our stores. So whether it's diverting waste from the landfill, conserving energy, or using new and innovative technologies to improve operations, sustainability and resiliency are simply good for business. We embrace these values and innovations not only because it leads to savings that keep our company competitive in the marketplace, but also because these values build a strong, resilient community operation and cooperation for decades to come. I'm excited about the draft climate action plan and for our community's future that we as businesses can work together on this and continue to build on this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much, Councilmember Raybould, for your commitment to our community on so many levels. The actions you've undertaken are exactly the kind that will help us achieve our 80 by 50 goal. And the private sector has such an important role to play in this work. Ultimately, the plan aims to provide a roadmap that can be used both by the public and private sectors for years to come to guide our city's progress towards a climate smart future. Feedback gained from, the, from engaging across sectors and with community members over the next several months will be integrated into the final plan. Much work lies ahead to determine how the recommended strategies that support our 80 by 50 goal will be prioritized and adopted to build resilience in Lincoln. But I am confident that the people of Lincoln who are demonstrating personal resilience at every turn during this pandemic are up to this task. Thank you again to Kim Morrow and Veritas Group, to Mickey Esposito, to Councilmember Raybould, to the Climate Resiliency Task Force, the City Sustainability Working Group, the Mayor's Environmental Task Force, and all those who so far have engaged with us in this effort. We appreciate all of you for dedicating your concern and your expertise and leadership to this effort. We look forward to finalizing the draft plan in partnership with our wider public as together we solidify our commitment to building a stronger, more resilient community and a better future for our children to inherit. Thank you, and we'll open it up for questions. Mayor Riley Johnson from the Journal Star. Hi, Riley. Hi, Mayor. Um, maybe a question for you or for um, Kim, uh, but could you maybe explain some of the thinking behind the goal of 80 by 50 as opposed to um, zero net uh, carbon that some people may be more familiar and kind of the distinction and uh, reasoning behind the choice. Sure. Um, say that just broadly, the 80 by 50 goal allows us to engage across multiple sectors. And of course, we're starting to see that transportation is one of the leading sectors in greenhouse gas emissions. So we wanted it to be an all-encompassing goal that invited participation across many sectors to have a meaningful impact. But I'll invite Kim back up to talk a little bit more about that net reduction that we posed as a challenge to our public. Way to the podium. Hi. Uh, if you could explain how it how it's measured uh, for those that may not be as familiar, uh, that would help too. 
Sure. And those are great questions, Riley. Thank you. Um, the, it was important to us to set an all-encompassing goal, as Mayor have said, to reduce emissions citywide. And there are a few different ways to, that organizations and cities are approaching that. And uh, your question asks, why did we choose 80% reduction rather than net zero? We had extensive conversation about that uh, very question. And um, there are a couple different reasons for it. One is because we, in some definitions of net zero, well, let me explain. Net zero means that the amount of emissions are offset by the amount of carbon that is sequestered. So it's kind of an accounting um, balance that allows uh, an entity to achieve net, net zero. Um, but that concept, while it's familiar to those of us who are working in this industry, it's not familiar to the majority of the general public. And we felt that using that kind of terminology may be confusing um, to people and um, might offset the kind of community engagement we'd like to have. Um, another reason is that some definitions of net zero carbon emissions actually include a little 10% or 20% window of, um, of wiggle room, just as a net uh, a zero waste goal includes actually 90% waste diversion. There's a 10% piece of wiggle room with the acknowledgement that it is difficult um, at times to get to 100% um, carbon, uh, get emissions actually down to zero when um, at this point at this point in time. The plan does have a 30-year time horizon, so there is the possibility of all kinds of different technologies coming online over that time that we expect will significantly change our opportunities and our balance. Other questions? Mayor, follow up. Um, how, how does this, um, how do you and your administration sort of um, make sure that the the work that went into this actually gets off the shelf in a time when uh, and into action and policy change when you know you're facing economic um, uncertainty related to the pandemic? Sure. Thanks for the question. Well, um, this work is incredibly important now and into the future. And as we look to prioritize strategies, we'll be taking a look at the cost of the different recommended strategies. But we'll also have to keep in mind the cost of inaction. You know, we are still waiting on millions of dollars of reimbursement for our well field damages up on the Platte River. Uh, that that's the cost to our Lincoln community that's real and significant. And so as we seek to make preparations to improve our infrastructure, something that cities do year after year, um, we will be applying a climate uh, related impact lens to that work. You know, levees that used to hold at a certain height may need to be built to higher levels in the future based on new climate related data around our changing weather patterns. So really this is about being smart. This is about continuing to do good work to mediate the balance between urban life and mother nature uh, and to do so in a way that's informed by new data and new realities. Other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Again, the plan is online at lincoln.ne.gov, keyword resilience. Uh, we'll be looking forward to engaging with the public over the coming months through virtual formats, and we'll be making more announcements about that in the future. But thank you so much for listening today, and tune in, and we look forward to working with you.